Our scripture lesson for this morning comes to us from the 25th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, verses 14 through 30. It's our lectionary text for today. Listen for God's word. For it is as if a man going out on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to their ability. Then he went away. The one who had received five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had given two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents, and see, I have made five more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been trustworthy with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of the master. And the one with two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy servant. You have been trustworthy with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I do not scatter. Then you ought to have invested my money and, receive, on, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. For to all who have more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And as for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I know, I did not pick this. Okay. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you draw near to us by the power of your spirit, through your word and through your word that took on flesh and dwelt among us as us, that we might know the fullness of your love. And so we pray that you will open our eyes and ears and hearts and minds, attuning all of our senses and our spirits to your word for us, that we might draw near to you. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So our lectionary passage for this morning is the middle parable in the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Now each of the parables in this chapter, from the ten maidens who were waiting for a bridegroom, to the story of the sheep and the goats who were separated in front of the judgment seat. Each of these parables offer us instruction about how to live as God's people, with one eye fixed on the here and now, and one eye looking forward to the kingdom that is to come when Christ returns to earth. Matthew lays out for us a string of apocalyptic images filled with warnings to believers that kind of give us goosebumps. 
Each story contains a cautionary tale about the consequence of short-sighted, perhaps even lazy decision-making that yields a harsh punishment from one in authority, whether the actors knew what it was expected of them or not. And so in the passage, the parable I just read, we hear of a wealthy landowner who went away for a while, and before leaving, he entrusts his treasure to three servants or slaves for safekeeping. To one, he gives five talents, two to the next, and one to the last. A talent being an amount of currency that was worth about a year and a half of wages. So two servants to whom he offered more of his treasure, they invest the treasure. They put it to work and it yields a return, each one doubling what they were given. And although we hear the conversation this, this landowner has upon his return with each of these servants, our text moves us forward to that last servant, the final servant who cautiously buries the treasure, afraid that the harsh master will be furious if even the tiniest portion is lost. Nothing is lost, we learn, but nothing is gained either. And when the landowner returns, he is furious with the one who buried the talent, sending him into the unknown darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. I am not going to lie. This is not my favorite passage in the Bible. I personally am leery of texts that use societal economics as a metaphor for the reign of God. I'm leery of passages that can be used by the church and that have been used by the church to leverage what's known as a prosperity gospel. You know, that idea that if you are righteous, God will bless you with material wealth over and over again. Material wealth, a sign of God's favor. And I'm leery of texts that emphasize a work's righteousness. Now, don't get me wrong. Faith without works is meaningless. But it concerns me when one might suggest that it's proper actions through which we are saved, proper actions which are our requirement for our eternal reward. But we are a Matthew 25 church. And as such, it seems not only fitting, but imperative that we would preach from the entirety of the 25th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. It seems important to step into this text, into all of it, rather run away from any of it, as too many people do. And it seems necessary to continually expand my view of God, lest I worship a God that I have constructed in an image of my own self. All right, so what is going on here? This is a complicated passage, a problematic one even. As many commentators point out what probably made us squirm in our seats as you heard me read. This dynamic of anything that would associate God with a slaveholder and humanity as slaves is problematic in any context. And yet most commentators believe that Matthew does cast God as the landowner in this parable, and humanity is cast as the servants. And so in that reading, the absent landowner reminds us of the tensions experienced by the early church. Those who waited for Christ to return in glory, expecting with a certain hope that Christ would show up again while they were still alive. We get in this read a message that God entrusts us with a treasure that is not ours to keep. Why our actions then should not simply to just receive the gifts God has given us by God and keep them safe and tidy, but rather we're to tend to the treasure, to put it to good use, to earn a return not only for our own reward, but for the glory of God 
offering it back to God in abundant measure. And that's not a bad read. And there are other commentators who offer an alternative perspective. One that suggests, and I quote, that the master, rather than a stand-in for God, is a, rem is a member of the unjust elite. The servant who buries the talent, rather than being a fearful and lazy slave, is one who refuses to be complicit in the exploitation carried out by his master, critiquing the unfruitfulness of money, which bears nothing when planted. He is cast out into the outer darkness, ostracized for not accepting an economy in which the poor will only get poorer, while the rich get richer. In this, he is not unlike Jesus, who will be cast out, spit upon, and crucified himself." End quote. Now, regardless which read of this text you favor, there is a common truth beneath and within these words. We hear as disciples of the living Christ that it takes risk to follow Jesus. Discipleship challenges us to live our beliefs, to make choices so that we might love with authenticity and courage, even when doing so doesn't feel safe. A life of faith is not tidy or cozy or confined, but rather, such a life commands brave decision-making. It commands loving action that stretches our comfort zones, our boundaries, our identities, our very way of being in the world. John Buchanan writes this. The point here is not really doubling your money and accumulating wealth. It's about living. It's about investing, it's about taking risks, and it is about Jesus himself and what he has done and what is about to happen to him. Mostly, it is about what Jesus hopes and expects of his disciples after he is gone. It is about being a follower of Jesus and what it means to be faithful to him. And so finally, it's about you and me. He goes on to say, Faith, many of us think, is about personal security, here and in the hereafter. Faith, we think, is no more risky than believing ideas in our heads about God and Jesus, getting our personal theology right, and then living a good life by avoiding bad things. But here, Jesus invites us to be his disciples to live our lives as fully as possible by investing them, by risking, by expanding the horizons of our responsibilities. It is to be bold and brave, to reach high and care deeply. So the parable is the invitation to the adventure of faith, the high-risk venture of being disciples of Jesus Christ." End quote. Maybe this is why this parable makes me squirm. I am not someone who is particularly fond of taking risks. I don't like headstands. I have no interest in skydiving. Hot air balloons are another matter, though. I have held on to things of which I should have let go for far too long because I've resisted change. And I frankly pride myself on keeping people safe, whether I am taking a group of teenagers on a mission trip to another state or whether I am advocating for aging parents in a hospital. And so this parable pushes me to ask myself where I might be falling short as a person of faith. What do I need to do differently? More so, what fears might be standing in my way or distorting my view of what is possible with a God through whom all things are possible? What do I have yet to do with what I have been given? 
What risk, what risks are mine to take? Now friends, I imagine that I am not alone. I am betting, in fact, that many of us spend a fair amount of time calculating risks or avoiding them altogether. As a species, we have an instinct to preserve as individuals and as a community, and so too, we often hesitate to innovate or stir the pot or even consider what it is to which we're clinging that we might need to release. And let's face it, most of us are tired. We have spent the last few years not only calculating the, the risks associated with life as we grew up knowing it, but we have added to our mental load the, the risks of COVID and gun violence and the far, far reach of, of social media and even AI. We've been navigating continually a fluctuating economy, the extreme disparities in our political landscape and the intersections of identity that make life riskier for some than for others. It is hard work. It's exhausting. And I also like to come to church to hear music that makes me feel like I am lying beside still waters. I want to read passages in scripture that will help me to feel more certain that Jesus is with me, that the Holy Spirit is giving me strength and that the body of Christ is surrounding me so that I too might faithfully live my life with a bit more ease and grace and the assurance that we're all in this together with Christ's help. And yet we receive this parable in our lectionary today along with the others in the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, and they prod us to consider the risks that we have yet to take. They prod us to consider how we might authentically live this life that we have been given, including our life of faith. Matthew challenges us to stretch our understanding of what it means to follow Jesus. Matthew encourages us to do the hard work of continually expanding our view farther, wider, encompassing a landscape, and a community in our sight that is as vast and wide as the love of God. Being a person in this world is risky business. It takes courage to rest in a world that measures your worth by your labor. And it is brave to do things like tell the truth or befriend someone who's unpopular or to even love yourself just as you are. It is audacious to trust in goodness and peace and justice and even in God in a world that testifies loudly that maybe none of these things matter or are within our reach. Yet we gather because we worship and serve a God who is our strength, our hope, our love. We serve a God who is not an absent guide leaving us to figure it all out for ourselves, but we serve a God who is with us always. This truth can supply us with the courage to live our faith out loud, to be led by the Holy Spirit to make faithful even when they are unpopular decisions, to stay the course, or to or to serve and speak up when life and faith stretch us far beyond our comfort zones. This is the truth that reminds us that we're not alone, that indeed we navigate these choices, this life together and with God's help. As the liturgical year winds down, as we take the next steps, in preparing to call our next pastor. As we strive as individuals and as a family of faith to embody the love and justice of God, I invite you and all of us to explore some questions together. What 
is it that we might need to do differently? What are the fears that are standing in our way or distorting our view of what is possible with God? What is it to which we are clinging that's holding us back? What do we have yet to do with what we have been given? What risks might we be called to take so that we might can most authentically express the hope we have in Christ and the call to live as Christ's people? And so people of God, siblings in Christ, let's not bury our treasure. Let us together be about the risky business of discipleship so that through us, through our community and our choices and our actions and our articulation of truth and our worship and our work, all will know the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Siblings, may it be so. Amen.